God has revealed really uh, things that are quite inaccessible to us uh, in this psalm. Uh, the problem that we face, of course, in life is that we grow indifferent to things that are eternal, things that really matter. And we get into this busy, hurry-up uh, day in which we live, and we forget that the most relationship, the most important relationship that we have on earth is the relationship that we have with God. We're very, very busy doing stuff, but we fail to stop and take time to really think about what we are doing, uh, why we are doing it, and what God's overarching purpose is for our lives. Psalm 90 really answers some very important questions for us. Questions like, what kind of life is truly satisfying? How can I have this type of quality of life? How do I, how do I live in such a way that will please the God who created me? Moses, in the psalm, saw many examples of lives that were being wasted in the wilderness. And that's, you know, we look at just, we pick certain verses out of this psalm, and we forget that the whole psalm is dealing with the wrath of God for the children, against the children of Israel in the wilderness. And they were, they were dying uh, off one by one because they had been a disobedient, contrary people. And uh, they were dry and barren. And that is exactly what we are faced with as we go through our lives. There are going to be times when everything seems to be dry and barren. Uh, we don't find satisfaction in the things of this life. And so when we're really, really busy doing the things of, uh, of this life, and all of our time and all of our attention is, attention is poured into just living for temporal things, then we begin to see the fruit, futility of that. When, when, any, when, it, when any person who belongs to Jesus Christ um, ends up living for things that are temporal, they are worshiping the creation more than they are worshiping the creator. And when you do that, you're kind of spinning in the futility of your mind. And you, as a child of God, you know it. And when you come to the end of yourself, you begin to ask questions like, well, why am I praying? Why am I reading my Bible? Why am I attending church? Are these things that are traditional? Are these things that I must do? Is this a list of duties that God has given to me? And if I do these duties, all of a sudden, everything will be uh, great? Well, I don't think it's reasonable for a Christian to ever get to the point where they think that, okay, I'm saved by grace through faith. I'm going to leave that behind now and I'm going to work my way into God's favor. I'll be the one that reads his Bible every day. I'll be the one that's in church every time the doors are open. And I'll be the one that prays two hours a day, you know. And people begin to spin their legalistic wheels around activities and they get nowhere. Some get so discouraged that they lose all hope and they leave church behind. Some of the most zealous people that I've, in my 25 year time here at Heritage, some of the most zealous people that I've ever met that have come through our church doors end up burning themselves out within a year or two and then they're gone. Because they are just, they're, they're thinking in their minds, if I do A, B, and C, then everything will be right for me. But that's not how the Christian life works. In this psalm, we learn two very important principles. The first is, God is eternal. The second is, man is temporal. Right? We're living in this life. But either we have eternal life or we don't. In John chapter 17 and verse 3, that verse tells us that to know Jesus Christ, to know him, is eternal life. That's a relationship. So, if I know God is eternal and man is temporal, I can put these principles together and realize that God has made me, he's created me, I'm living within this temporal reality around me, but he wants to work something in and through me that's far more important. And that's what makes life truly satisfying. God takes a temporal person and he pours through that person through the personality of that person, 
through the uh, circumstances of that person, through the life experience of that person, through that person's family. God pours his truth through that person. And as God does that, God transforms not only the individual, but he transforms the people around him. Why? Because it's God doing the work. See, relationship, you say, well, we've got to read our Bibles, right? Well, no, we don't have to. See, that's the thing. We, we want to. We have a great desire to know God. We want the Word of God to be deeply embedded within our hearts so that the Holy Spirit has something uh, with which he can move and, and operate in our lives and, and he can bring us along in a relationship with God. So God is transforming our temporal lives into eternal lives. Now, when I look at verse 17, there are two basic questions that I'm going to ask right when I start studying this verse. The first is, what does Moses mean when he says the beauty of the Lord? And the second is, how can the beauty of the Lord be upon me? Because isn't that the objective? I mean, that sounds pretty good. To have the beauty of God resting upon me, I want that, right? Well, I think that you need to get to the point where you see that the beauty of the Lord is found in that relationship that you have with him. If you look at Romans chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we see that God has shown to us, as mankind in general, God has shown to us his invisible attributes. We can clearly see his invisible attributes uh, in the things that he has made. He has made himself known through creation. Those who fail to believe are those who fail to glorify God as God. Instead, they hold up and vaunt up the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Their foolish hearts are darkened. Their, their life experience is darkened. They're not able to reflect the glory of God. If you look at the stars in the sky, I don't know if you can see them tonight. I can see the moon on my way over. But if you were to look at the stars in the sky uh, and, and, and pinpoint their locations and studied them for a little bit and began to realize that around us not only swirl these stars, but... Also, all of the galaxies that new telescopes have revealed for us. You look at the vast distances and, and the many things that, that we cannot even explain with all the technology that we have today. And then, not only this macroscope out, start to move in and, and go small and, and begin to think about molecules and atoms and, and the small world around us or a tiny grain of sand and, and the seashores and, and the beauty and the harmony of it all and how God has designed it and how perfect it is. God is indeed good to us. He's gracious. He's unrivaled in his power. And we see that in creation. I was thinking about philosophy and philosophers this week. Uh, people give great credence to uh, philosophy. I think it's a huge mistake. Uh, know this from someone who has studied philosophy. And it is a fruitless endeavor. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, because they just recycle the same ideas genera generation after generation, but they call it something different, you know? And you, you begin to study this stuff and you begin to understand that they don't have the answers. They're just kind of floating ideas out there. And I'll, I'll read these philosophies and I, I can't even wrap my mind around what the author is trying to communicate. And then I, I come to the Word of God and I see that God has taken the philosopher, the person who is erudite, pe people that are really, really intelligent, and God has taken the common man and he has communicated to both. And everywhere in between both spectrums, God has communicated, and he has communicated through his word. He has shown us his wisdom, his goodness, and how it's unsearchable and eternal, and we find the word of God to be wholly satisfying. God is a creator, but more than that, God is a redeemer. The Bible says in Colossians 1.15 that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 16 
says that as King, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be, glo- to whom be honor and everlasting power. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 says that Jesus makes the visible invisible. In him is the brightness of the Father's glory and the express image of the Father's person. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, the Father commanded the light to shine out of darkness and he has shown in our hearts this light so that we might have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If you want to know what the beauty of the Lord is, look no further. It's found in Jesus Christ. It's found in him and a relationship that you have with him, a real one. A relationship where you understand who he is and what he has done for you. You want that beauty to be upon you. It's one thing to know about the beauty of the Lord. It's another thing for the beauty of the Lord to actually rest upon you. What does that look like? What does it look like to have the beauty of the Lord resting upon believers? Well, it's disciplined, self-controlled, but it's also loving and gentle and kind. Okay. All of the things that we read about that, that are fruit that's brought to bear in our lives because of the Holy Spirit working, that's the beauty of the Lord. See, how can I see God today? I can't see him. People will often say that when I'm talking to them. I've never seen a visible manifestation of God. And then you want to correct them. You want to say you have. You've seen it in his children. You've seen it in the men and and the women who belong to Christ. There is your visible manifestation of God. We are his children, and so we look like him. Jesus is the one who mediates the beauty of the Lord God. And we look to him to make sure that he shines in and through us. Not only this, but he has given us the opportunity to reflect the beauty of God, the beauty of the Lord, to reflect that to the world at large. I was talking to uh, the residents at Cortona Park today. I go there every Wednesday and speak to uh, some of the elderly that are there and teach them the Bible. And I told them about the... uh, town in Norway where it is dark from October all the way to March where they don't see the light of the sun but the town had a a great idea they decided that they were going to take a mirror and mount it upon this mountain and somehow catch the rays of the sun from this mountain and reflect it onto the town square so that they would have a little bit of sunlight in the midst of all of that darkness. I'd say that'd have to be a pretty gigantic mirror. And and that's what God wants in our lives. He wants the surface of our lives to become broader. He he wants the, the idea of you to be crucified so that he can be glorified. He wants you to reflect, even as the moon does, because the moon has no source of light in and of itself, he wants you to reflect his glory. That's how the beauty of the Lord rests upon us, and that's how it works in and through us. I think the primary reason that we come together on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday morning, the primary reason that we come together as Christians is so that we can behold the beauty of the Lord together. And so that we can marshal an effort to which we can go out and reflect that beauty to people in our community. That's what God wants in our lives. Psalm 27, 4, David wrote, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You say, well, we we don't have a temple today. No, the venue may have changed. Okay, we might not have a temple, but we have a sanctuary. We have a place where we come and we find rest together. Rest in our worship. Rest in the beauty of the Lord. But still we have a great desire to see his power and his glory at work. In Genesis chapter 1, we read very foundational verses. 
God speaking within the triune Godhead says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The primary reason for the beauty of the Lord to rest upon us may be found in the fact that we have to worship him and glorify him. But the secondary reason is that we are in his image. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 tells us, though, there's something different about Christians. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God has worked and moved uniquely in our lives by redeeming us so that we can put on the new man and make him visible more and more every day. We call that progressive sanctification. We're looking more and more like Christ every single day. And in that way, the beauty of the Lord rests upon us. Ephesians 4 verse 24 says, Put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That's the new man. Created in true righteousness and holiness. We were false and full of sin, but not anymore. We have put on the new man. And so, in the beauty of the Lord, we behold him and we will behold him with unveiled face. There will be a time when we will see him. The beauty of the Lord shines forth and reflects and radiates to other people. And God is able to use our lives to encourage and to strengthen and to give hope. What happens inside of us is this transformation that takes place from one level of glory to another level of glory to another level of glory, as it says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. And that never stops. We constantly are looking more and more like Christ until we are brought together with our Lord Jesus in that day. And we are perfect. And our body, our resurrection body is given to us and we are able to reflect him with all that we are and with all that we have at that point. And we will do that with great joy throughout all of eternity. Ephesians 4 and verse 13 says that we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's talking about you and that's talking about me. And so may the Lord grant that his beauty rest upon us today to a greater degree than it did yesterday. And if things didn't go well today, that's what God's mercy is there for. It's new for tomorrow morning so that you can reflect his glory then. We want the glory of God to flourish. We want the grace of God to flourish in our lives. And we want Jesus Christ to be working in such a way that we show to the world that God is all in all. And we want that to happen right now. We don't want to wait until that day. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this psalm. It's so encouraging. We, we think of the, the people in Moses' day and they did not live the lives that they should have lived. And they suffered a great deal wandering in a barren wilderness. And I fear, Lord, that many of your children do that even today. And we look and we wonder, I wonder how many were saved in the wilderness. But I, I wonder how many are saved in the churches in America today. How many really want to live for you, Lord? I know that there's a remnant. We cannot be like Elijah. Lord, raise up a powerful presence here in this church. May the beauty of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish, Lord, the work of your hands. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>